Hi guys, welcome to today's video. My name is Aaron Song and I'm excited to share my Season 13 Cassiopeia Guide. I've been playing League of Legends in Season 4 and hit Masters in Season 6 and even hit 1000 LP in Season 12, primarily playing mages like Cassio, Rai, Syndra, Victor, Zira, and many more. Cassiopeia has always been my highest win rate champion throughout my time playing and I've always felt the most comfortable with her because of her 1v9 kit potential. I solo killed well-known high elo players, pro players, and even got recognition from one of the most successful pro players in NA, Aphromoo. Oh my god. My fucking snake, dude. Oh my god! What the fuck? Devil? Wow. I like that. I reached rank 1 Cassiopeia multiple times and even at one point had two accounts both rank 1 and rank 2. In today's video, I'll be going over Cassio's abilities, ruin choices, item builds, and even giving you guys some tips and tricks to start carrying your inting bot laners. Before the video begins, I just want to preface this by saying that my way of playing Cassiopeia isn't the correct way, nor am I the best Cassiopeia player in the world. But this is just something that worked for me, and I hope you guys learn a thing or two, so let's get started. Okay, let's start with the runes first. For the runes, I typically like to run Conquer in 90% of the matchups that I play. Conquer synergizes so well with Cassiopeia because of the sustained healing that you get, the extra damage that you get, and the fact that you can stack it up really, really fast because of how Cassiopeia's kit works. Now, there are some matchups that make Phase Rush a better option, but that's something that we'll discuss later in this video. For the second part of the Precision Tree, you want to be taking Presence of Mind. As we all know, Cassiopeia can dish out a lot of damage, but she spends a lot of mana doing so, and running out of mana during mid to late game teamfights is really detrimental for your team. So taking Presence of Mind is a very good option to not have to really worry about that. For the third part of the Precision Tree, you want to be taking Tenacity. Cassiopeia is an immobile champ and she can't really buy boots early because of her passive, so she's very susceptible to a lot of CC. And when you get hit by a long range CC late game as well, you kind of just want to be able to get out as fast as possible to get out of that sticky situation. So tenacity is always going to be your number one choice. Now for the last part of the precision tree, you want to either take cut down or last stand. For me personally, if there are like three tanky members on the enemy team, cut down is always going to be my first choice. But for 99% of the games, you want to be taking last stand. Last Stand is really, really good with Cassiopeia because she likes to skirmish a lot in 1v1s, 1v2s, even 1v3s as well. So you will always be below 60% HP, which means Last Stand is always going to be the perfect choice for you. As for secondaries, there are two choices that you can make. It's either going to be the Resolve Secondary Tree or the Sorcery Secondary Tree, but we'll discuss the Resolve Secondary Tree first. Um, as of recently, I've been kind of going back to Leandrids and it's a lot more fun that way for me as well. And the only downside with that is that I'm a lot more squishier than I would normally like to be. So I've been kind of opting to go the conditioning and overgrowth route because as we mentioned before, Cassiopeia is a battle mage and the longer you survive, the higher the percentage outcome of winning a team fight becomes in your favor. Now that's not to say that if you're gonna go Roa, you can't build Resolve Secondary because the more the more survivability and durability that you have, the better anyways. But for personal preference wise, I don't get a lot of CDR when I go Roa build. And it feels a little weird playing Cassiopeia without CDR, which is why I kind of like to go Sorcery Second if I am going the Roa build and pick Transcendence. Now, for the last part of the Sorcery Tree, it's either going to be Gathering Storm or Water Walking. In like, majority of the games, Gathering Storm is always going to be the best move, but for games that I know that my jungler wants to fight in rivers or in the enemy jungle, like in Delhi or Kindred, Water Walking is always the best choice for me, because I want to be there as quickly as possible. Now for these three down here, it's always the most optimal to go Ability Haste over Adaptive because of the scaling that it has, and having CDR on mages like Cassiopeia is always going to be really, really nice to have. But these are very interchangeable and just personal preference. I sometimes like to go adaptive as well if I am going to play for more lane dominant and for more lane prior. But CDR is always really good. And for this one, you would always want to take adaptive force. And the only times I would ever take double resistance in the second part of the three down here is if I know that 99% of their damage is going to be either AD or 99% of the damage is going to be AP. Now for this one, it just depends on the matchup that you have and you're laning against. Like if you're laning against a magic damage dealer, you take magic resist. Same with AD champions, you take armor. And if you don't know the matchups, because there's been a lot of flex picks recently, 
um, taking health is always a really good choice as well. And you'll never go wrong with that. Now I do want to discuss something that isn't very common and something that I do. And it works for me because of the play style that I like to play. But instead of going the typical sorcery and resolve secondary, I've been kind of going the taste of blood and ghost pour route because I play for lane dominance and I play for solo kills a lot. And for taste of blood, it's really, really good and it synergizes really well with my playstyle because I like to trade a lot and I like to win trades and this will help me win trades a lot more often. And I take Ghost Pro because I play very active in lane, I play very aggro in lane, and I'm very susceptible to ganks just in general because Cassiopeia is very immobile and she's very easy to gank um, early on. So taking Ghost Pro helps me get more AP, helps me find junglers and lasting vision a lot longer, so it helps me to let, die less to ganks. And because I'm playing for solo kills in lane, I take double adaptive. And that's just something that I run personally. It's probably not advised to run this unless you're very comfortable with Cassiopeia. Now, even though you can take Conquer in like 90 to 99% of the matches that you play in, the higher the elo you go, the more likely you will get counterpick and you need to take another keystone and that keystone is phase rush. Now, the thing that makes phase rush really, really good in these counter matchups is because a lot of Cassiopeia's counters are longer range and have a lot of slow in CC. So the best thing to take is into these counter matchups is phase rush because it gives you 75% slow resistance and gives you decaying move speed when you do proc it. And being able to get on them is the only way you can deal with the champions that have a longer range against you unless you use flash. Now I've already discussed why I go these specific runes so I'm just not going to mention those and speed right through this but if I am going phase rush I like to go mana flow, transcendence, Gathering Storm, and because I typically take Phase Rush in harder counter matchups, I like to go Resolve Secondary just for a little bit extra security in lane. And if I really need Bone Plating, I can go Bone Plating as well. These two are very interchangeable, but taking Conditioning is probably the most popular choice. I go CDR, I go Adaptive Force, and I either go, depending on the matchup, it's most likely the AP matchups that are really hard, and so taking Magic Resist is always good. But if there are some AD matchups that are pretty unplayable, you go Armor, and like I said, if you need health, you need health. Now I do want to mention one last keystone and I know I'm going to get flamed for this, but if you are really, really bored with going the traditional routes of going phase rush conquer and you just want to spice things up because I've done it before and I haven't done it just like in any low elo games. I've actually done it in my challenger games as well. And it was even against a pro player blaze olive and I ended up winning the game and solo killing him multiple times. But if you become really, really experienced with Cassio and you get really bored, I can go Electrocute, Taste of Blood, Ghost Poro, and Ultimate Hunter while going Mana Flow and Transcendence and going a Double Adaptive. And this is kind of like my burst Cassiopeia build. I like to just go Ludens and Shadow Flame and everything like that. But I'm just gonna tell you, if you don't do this in your solo queue games unless you're very, very confident that you can do well with any types of build, any types of runes. So don't blame me if you end up getting flamed and going like 0-20. Now that we got the runes out of the way, let's go talk about the items that you can build on Cassiopeia. There are four main items that you can build on Cassiopeia, and these include Rod of Ages, Leandris, Everfrost, and Ludens. Let's start with the Rod of Ages build first. Now, no matter which item you go, Rod of Ages, Leandris, Ludens, or Everfrost, you always want to start tier over Doran's Ring. You'll soon realize that Cassiopeia wastes a lot of mana during the early laning phase, and you need tier to actually be able to lane properly. Otherwise, if the enemy plays aggressively and you have to, you are forced to trade, you'll start running out of mana very quickly and have to end up basing it on a really, really bad timer or having to waste your TP to get back into lane. Now, on your first base, you always, always want to go or fill a potion, and you can either go Doran's Ring or Dark Seal. In my opinion, I like to go Doran's Ring more because I get the AP and you got the health and you get the mana regen if you hit and fight enemy champions. And I don't go Dark Seal only because of the fact that I do fight a lot, so there's a lot more risk at hand that I'm just not going to be able to get the value out of it. And if I'm not facing a counter matchup, I typically opt to go for the damage components in Roa, only because of the fact that I need to get early prio since in this meta, um, it's just perma fighting with your jungler and your bot laners. And if I am facing a counter matchup, then I opt for the catalyst and try to scale a little bit more. Now, the reason why you don't just want to rush Roa as quickly as possible and you kind of want to delay it by building Refillable Potion, Doran's Ring, or Dark Seal is because you want to utilize its passive to its fullest extent. Now, Roa's passive is that once it's fully stacked, you get a free level, right? So the longer you stall, the better because it takes a lot more experience to level up in the later stages of the game than it is in the earlier stages. So let's just say, for example, you finish Rod of Ages at level 13 and then you get a free level to 14. And that's a lot more value than if you finish Rod of Ages at level 11 and only get 
level 12, because it takes more experience to get to level 13 to 14 than it is from 11 to 12. Now comes mid to late game. So once you're in your mid to late game, you wanna be able to rush your three core items. Now, this is the order that I really build it in. So I build Roa first, and typically when I go Roa, I kinda like to offer the Archangels because I need the CDR, because like I said, Roa doesn't provide the CDR that Leandris does. So I like to have that little CDR and extra damage. And then I build Rylai's as well for third. Now, these two can be interchangeable. I know a lot of people actually prefer going Rylai's second, and I actually prefer that as well, but only when I'm going Leandris. Now for the rest of the build, I kind of opt to go for a defensive item fourth if it's a standard game and nobody's stacking MR. And the best defensive item that you can build on Cassiopeia is actually Gargoyle's Stoneplate. You get 60 armor, 60 magic resist, and you get a shield that's equal to a percentage of health that you have. And that means that you'll get a massive shield since Cassiopeia already builds items that give her health. And if a majority of their team comp is mostly AD damage and they don't really have a lot of magic resist, then I kind of just opt to go for the Zhonyas and vice versa with the Banshees if they have a lot of magic damage dealers. And the only time where I would build boys that fourth is when I know I have magic damage dealers on my team, like two or three, and they're already stacking MR early. Then I build boys that fourth and a defensive item fifth. And you kind of don't want to build Rabadon's death cap as your fourth or fifth item only because of the fact that there are so many other items that synergize as well with Cassiopeia and you're just really getting raw AP from death cap anyways. Now let's go talk about the other items that you can build on Cassiopeia starting with Leandris. Now a lot of these builds are going to be very very similar in build paths the only difference is just like you know the different components and different mythic items but like we said again you still want to start with tier you want to go for two health pots at the beginning of the game you want to base and try to get a refillable potion a Doran's ring or a dark seal and always always if you're going to build Leandris or Everfrost or Ludens you always want to build Lost Chapter first because it gives so much value to mages. Now for the three core items that you do build on Cassiopeia it's pretty much the same except the fact that I build Leandris first and I go Rylai second instead of Archangels like I did with Roa, and then Archangels third. And like I said, these two items are very interchangeable. You know, it's just a very personal preference of whether you want to build Archangels and have a little more damage, or you want to have utility and chase down potential with Rylai's. Now for the rest of the build, it's the same concept. You want to build a defensive item fourth if it's a standard game. If it's not a standard game and you have a lot of magic damage dealers on your team, you kind of just want to go for the Void Staff. Same with the Zonis and Banshees. Now if they don't have any magic damage dealers, you kind of just want to go for Zonis over Gargo. And if they have more magic damage dealers and no AD damage, then you just want to build Banshees over Gargoyles. And remember, the sixth item, you always want to build Ravadon's last. Now, those are the two most popular mythic items that you can run on Cassiopeia, and also the two best ones as well. But we do want to mention that Everfrost is still a viable option that you can take, and it's very similar build path with Leandris, and it's pretty much all the same. Like I said, if you, you know, you want to start with tier, you get two paws, you want to base and get refillable potions, Doran's Ring, and then Lost Chapter, or Dark Seal. And like I said, again, these two are very interchangeable. You can either go Rylai second after getting Everfrost or Archangel second. It's just personal preference, like I said. And same with the rest of the build. They're all pretty much the same. Now, the last build you can go is Ludens. Like I mentioned earlier, you might get flamed for this, um, but if you do end up going Electric Cute and wanting to have fun, you know, it's a little bit different. Same starter item, same first base, but the difference is that you wanna go Ludin, Shadow Flame, and Archangels, and you kinda of don't wanna go Rylai's as often if you're trying to go for the burst one-shot build, because it doesn't give that much AP. And for the rest of the build, if you do wanna go for the one-shot build, you kinda of wanna go Rabadon's and Void Staff. And you can kinda of go for a defensive item for the, for the last slot. So to wrap things up, you pretty much just want to go for your mythic item of your choice, whether it's going to be Leandris, Everfrost, or Roa. And like I said, the two most popular ones that work well are the Roa and Leandris ones. And then you want to either get Archangel second or Archangel's third and Rylai second or Rylai's third. And then for the rest of the build, you kind of want to go a defensive item fourth and you want to go void staff fifth and then Rabadons will always be last no matter what. Now that we got the item builds out of the way, let's discuss which summoner spells that I take and which ones that I've had the most success on. The first summoner spell you can take on Cassio is TP. I think TP is the most OP summoner spell in the game when used correctly, and in like 99% of the matchups that I play in, I do take TP only because of the fact that when I'm in higher elos, people tend to counterpick me if I am blind picking the champion, and I kind of need to get through the laning phase without falling behind in CS, tempo, or EXP, and TP is a great way to help with that. 
Now, the biggest reason why I think TP is the best summon spell for Cassio is because the way I play Cassio mid to late game, and this is not just me, but for a lot of other people, she has very, very good split push potential. Now, the reason why she has good split push potential is because she can take 1v1s, 1v2s, 1v3s, and draw so much pressure on the map. And being able to be on the side lane drawing so much pressure, and having the threat of joining a team fight within seconds is something that TP allows you to have. And this is why I take TP in 99% of the matchups that I play in. Now, I do think that if you are below Masters Plus, you should be just taking a defensive summoner spell or a combat summoner spell to gain advantages that way, because not a lot of people in lower elos know how to use TP to its full potential. That goes for both you and your enemy. But if you do want to end up trying to learn how to use TP, you should just watch either pro player VODs with their streaming solo queue or even come to my VODs and watch it as well. Aside from TP, you can take defensive summoner spells and they work very very well with Cassio and these include a barrier, exhaust, cleanse, or heal. Now I do think the number one defensive summoner spell is barrier and exhaust being number two and then cleanse just being very situational depending on the matchup that you're in. Let's just say for example you're facing Lissandra, you kind of want to take cleanse, right? Because you don't want to perma die at level six. Now, Barrier and Exhaust work very, very well with Cassio, only for the fact that she needs to survive, like I mentioned multiple times in this video. The fact that Last Stand can also synergizes really well with Barrier and Exhaust when you're low HP is just Chef's Kiss. Now, I think Heal is okay. A lot of the matchups, you probably won't even need Heal, and it's not as, it's not as valuable as Barrier or Exhaust, in my opinion. But you can still take it if you, if you really, really want. Now to wrap things up, the order of which I would take my summoner spells would be TP number 1, Ghoster Barrier number 2, and Exhaustor Ignite number 3, and then Cleanse would be very very situational. Let's go over Cassio's abilities very quickly. Now starting with her passive, she is unable to buy boots, and she is the only champion that can't buy boots in the game, but in turn, she gains movement speed after every level that she gains, which is really, really good because she can basically be the only champion that can efficiently buy six items without really losing much. Her Q is a dot damage skill shot that gives her movement speed every time she lands on an MA champion, like so. Now, her W is what makes Cassio very, very unique and very, very good, and also kind of kind of weeds out the good Cassio players and the bad Cassio players. So essentially her W is an AoE ability that grounds and slows target that are inside of her W, which means you are unable to flash or dash if you are standing on top of her W. And this is why people who play champs that have a lot of dashes and a lot of movement and a lot of mobility hate playing against Cassio because you are unable to move at all. You can't dash, you can't flash, and it's just very, very good against countering champions like those. Next is Cassio's E. This is where Cassio gets most of her damage from because of the fact that it's very low CP and does a lot of damage. Now, just by itself, it doesn't do as much damage as you can see, and you're just kind of wasting a lot of mana. But as long as you land your Q first and then you press E, that's when you get another extra set of damage because of the fact that if the enemy is poison, and the only way you can poison someone is by using your Q on them or have them being on your W. So when they're poisoned, they take an additional 71 damage. So it's basically double the damage if you have poison on them. And that's what makes Hasio so great. And last but not least, we have her ulti. Her ulti is basically a big AoE slow and a big AoE stun. Now, the only way you can stun someone with Cassio's ulti is if they're facing you. So that's what you that's the ideal situation that you want to have because you know being able to cc them is very very great but if they aren't facing you you only get the slow part which is still very very great because in general cassio's scaling on her ult damage is a good anyways and the big slow is enough to just win team fights regardless if even if you don't land the stun as well now to quickly recap everything, Cassio's passive allows her not to get any boots, but she gets movement speed every level. Her Q is a dot damage that is a skill shot, and you get movement speed if you do end up landing it on a champion. Um, her W is a AoE ground slash low that enemy champions can't dash or flash in. Her E is a lot of damage and very, very spammable, but you should only be spamming it if you have your poison landed by your Q or they're on top of your W. And last but not least, her ult is an AoE stun or a slow, depending on if they are facing you or not. So if they're facing you, they get stunned. If they're not facing you, all they do is get stunned. So now that we got all the abilities out of the way, we have to talk about which ability you should be maxing first and which ability you should be getting in order of 
when to level them up. So at the beginning of the game, you can either start Q in harder matchups, and it does work well into like Orianna, Victor, and Syndra matchups, but for the majority of the games, you'll be wanting to start E, as E helps you CS better, and if they end up trying to fight you melee, you can auto E and you win trades pretty often because of Conquer and how much damage you get. So in general, you always want to start with E, and then you get Q second, and it's personal preference, depending on the matchup that you do play in, you can either get W third or put another extra point into E. And after all that, you do want to end up maxing E first, and then Q, and then obviously R at level 11, or at level 6, 11, and 12, and then W last. So the most basic combo for Casio is just landing your Q, and then spamming your E constantly, right? And when you have 0% CDR, you can only be able to spam 4 E's before your poison runs out. And when you're at 20% CDR, you can spam up to 5 E's before your poison runs out. And even though this is the most basic combo you can have on Casio, and you can get away with winning games like this, you should be weaving in your autos in between your E's, especially in the early game when you don't have enough CDR. This is really, really important. You get so much more damage out of it. So let's just say, for example, you just land... It's 4 E's, right? Before the poison runs out. And you would do 708 damage here. Now, if you're weaving in your autos in between your E's, like so, it's a world's difference. You have 845 damage instead versus 708, and you were able to stack Conquer fully, whereas if you didn't auto in between your abilities, you wouldn't have been able to stack your Conquer. Now that we got the most basic combo out of the way, I do want to mention the fact that not a lot of people are utilizing the Q movement speed that you get. Now, most people, when they, as soon as they land Q and they're chasing someone, because a lot of the times when you are getting hit by a Castillo Q, most people will run away because they know how much damage you can dish out. So when you're pressing Q and when they are immediately in range of E, they press E while the enemy champion's running away. And when you do press E on Cassiopeia, you do stand still for like half a second and it, half a second might not seem a lot, but I, there's been a lot of instances where if I just held my E until I got a little bit closer with the movement speed buff that I do get from Q, I probably would have killed them, and they did end up living that way as well. So instead of just like pressing Q and immediately as soon as you're in range pressing E from the maximum distance, what you want to do is press Q, walk a little bit closer, and then start pressing E, if that makes sense. So always try to utilize your Q movement speed that you get. So as soon as you land Q, don't spam E from the maximum distance, because you will be playing pretty much maximum distance as and when you're in laning or playing against someone, right? So you press Q, walk forward first, and then start pressing E. Another tip is that don't panic use your W. Hold it until the last moment possible. Let's just say for example, let's just say for example, I'm gonna spawn a I'm gonna spawn a dummy here. Let's just say this is Cassidin. Essentially this is Cassidin, right? And a Cassidin R is in here. Now if you're just panic using your W like this, he's just gonna walk out this way and then R out, right? His R is on like a decent amount of cooldown early, so it's not up permanently, but if you had just held your W a little bit, but instead of using your W here, you press Q like this instead, and then while he's trying to like run away or walk out, then you press W at the last moment before he R's, then you get a little bit of extra like one or two more seconds of damage dealing, and that could kill him as well. Now you don't have to use your W defensively, nor do you have to use it offensively as well. You can use it to control a certain corridor of the map, especially good when you're taking objectives like Dragon. So let's just say for example you're taking Dragon, all you have to do is press W here, and more than likely enemy champions will not really want to walk in this specific area because the slow is very very big it's a 40 percent slow and you get rylas as well so it's even a bigger slow as well and you aren't able to dash or flash so you're kind of at risk and putting yourself at risk of dying there so essentially you can block off a certain corridor and start getting the objectives and even if they do end up walking and they're bad players and they do end up walking on top of your w you can just turn on them pressing e and you can also ult them as well as they're coming through not only can you use W to secure the monster objective like we talked earlier, but it can also be used to siege towers very very easily and this is really really nice when you have Baron. And all you really have to do is just press W over here and most of the time enemies champions will be a little bit dissuaded and they'll wait outside here while you're hitting tower for free or they have to walk around all the way and even then you can just focus your abilities over here and you'll be able to take towers pretty easily from that. 
Now as a general rule of thumb, you should be using your E to last hit minions with it, and the reason you do so is because you get the mana back that you spend, and it's a good way to secure minions without missing any, because as we all know, minions are the most consistent way to get gold and to get ahead in the game. So let's just say for example we see a minion here with 1 HP, you press E and you get the mana back, and it's just really really easy, and you should be aiming for at least 7 to 8 CS a minute on Cassio, as you have an ability that helps you last hit. Now the way I last hit with Cassio with E is that I usually auto before I E. Now let's just say for example this minion right here. Now I would auto it first, and then I press E and you secure it pretty easily. Now another good thing about your E is that you can actually E before your Q lands, and like we mentioned earlier, you want to use your Q and then you want to press E, right? So you don't really have to wait for the Q to fully land, you can just start spamming your E as soon as you know your Q is going to land. Now let's just say for example, some people that don't really know how to play Casio will probably press Q and then press E after it's like they fully see it finished, right? But in general, you can just press QE immediately after, as you can see. So you just press Q and you press E immediately and the damage still goes through and that's a nice thing to know. Because then you won't lose any DPS and you actually kill them a lot faster than you normally would have. So just always remember, you can always press QE basically at the same time. If you guys didn't know this already, Casio can use other people's poison, like Twitch, Teemo, and Singe, to get the extra damage from E. So in general, Cassio's main damage comes from using her poison and pressing E after, right? So you have to land your Q and then you start swearing E, right? But if you have a Twitch, Teemo, or Singe that is poisoning an enemy champion, you don't have to land your Q and you can just start spamming your E because poison works that way with Cassio. So just remember that if you ever have a teammate that deals poison damage you don't have to land your q and you can just immediately start pressing e and it's a good way to know so that you know you're not really wasting time and trying to like land your skill shot on your q or anything like that and you can save your w for a little bit later as well now this is another good tip to know about how your ult works and how it stuns now most people know that when you're in front of cassio they get stunned right here right but some people don't know that as long as the front half is in front of you it stuns so even this will stun right here and most people will be like oh what the hell i wasn't even like facing Cassio, but that's another good thing to know to catch people off guard. Now if you do a, if you do it like at the right angle, or like the side side angle, it, it won't stun. You still have to be a little bit in front of them, but you can put them from the side like this. Let's go over some Cassio ult interactions so that you can start using them in your games. Now let's just say for example the target dummy is a Lee Sin and this is just any other random champion. Now in general, you can't stun anybody that isn't facing you with Cassio, right? So this doesn't get stunned at all. But if a Lee Sin ends up kicking this enemy dummy, no matter which direction he faces, and as long as he's airborne, and I press R on that person while he's airborne, they will get stunned. So you can start using this little tip in your games if you have a Lee Sin in your games as well. And this also works with Blitzcrank Hook and like Nautilus Hooks as well. So let's just say, for example, the enemy champion's facing away, and this is a Blitzcrank, and the Blitzcrank pulls the enemy champion, and it's still not going to be facing me, right? But if I press R immediately, he will get stunned. So what most people don't know is that when the enemy champion inputs an auto or ability towards you or forward to you and you and it's just before the R, they will get stunned. So that's why some people are confused about the fact that like, oh, but how can I get stunned? I was completely turned around. But if they did input an ability or an auto beforehand, then that was the reason why. And most people don't know that. So let's keep it on the let's keep it on the low. Make sure you're using blast cones as another form of flash to increase the distance of your R. So for example, this ulti will not stun anybody, right? Because I'm out of the distance clearly. But if I hit the blast gun beforehand and then press R, I am in distance now. So make sure to use that to catch people off guard. So let's go over the abilities that you can synergize your flash with. And the first ability is going to be Q. Now clearly this is out of distance for your Q, correct? And it's not hitting him, it's the maximum distance, it's not going to hit him. Now, let's just say for example, this guy is like 1 HP and you know that your regular E can't kill him and you kind of need to land your Q because Q has a good amount of damage so what you want to do is you can press q and then flash so q flash and now it's in distance right and that's a lot faster than just pressing flash q you see how a little bit slower it is and then people will react to the flash sound as well especially if they're one hp but if you just keep flash you know you might be able to catch someone off guard now i don't normally use this in any situation but you can if you want now another good flash trick that you can synergize your ability with is actually your W. This will this is a really good tip that you should be able to use in a lot of your games, I feel like. And so we know that this is the distance of W, right? It, like clearly it's not on him. But if you have your cursor on someone else, on the enemy champion, and you just press W flash, 
it reaches the distance and now they're grounded and they can't react to that flash or anything like that because they are unable to dash or flash within your W. So it's a really good tip to know. Now, last but not least, we have the R flash. Now, everyone knows how to do this, right? All you have to do is just input your R first and then flash. As if so. Now, the reason why this is so good is that you can catch people off guard and it's really, really hard to react to as it's really, really fast. And it's a lot faster than just pressing R and flash. It, it, there's too much, there's too much downtime. And like I said, people will react to the flash sound and you won't be, they'll be able to turn around or just like flash out as well, right? So don't do this, but instead press R and then flash, as you can see. Now, another good thing that you can use this for is that if the enemy is just sieging right here for your turret and they don't know that you're over here for some reason, then maybe they ran out of wards and they just can't get this ward over the raptors. Now, you don't want to do a flash ult because you see how slow it is. And like I said, people will react to the sound of the flash. But if you are flash and you input the R before your flash, there's very, very little downtime and there's it, it, it'll be very lucky if they can react to it. You see that? They get all stunned if you just R and then flash the last second, they still all get stunned like that. And it's a really, really good Keep trick to catch people off guard in Fog of War and everything like that. And there's one last trick that I like to do with R, with the R flash. And this is something that has gotten me a lot of solo kills and um, even against pro players. And I'll, I'll show some examples actually um, after I talk about this, but now, because of the tendencies of League players and just League in general, when you see an enemy champion run away, your first instinct is to just walk forward as well. So let's just say, for example, my character model is after I fight them like this, and I start running away, right? Like this. The enemy champion who was originally running away will start turning around because they'll be like, oh, why is Cassio running? Now I'm free to just walk forward. And that's when you can utilize that little timing window to R flash. So let's say, for example, I'm fighting this guy right here. And I'm like here, and then I put my cursor right here as I'm running away, and then all I have to do is R flash, and then most of the time it will catch people off guard, due to the fact that League players have the tendency to phase forward when they see another champion running away. So I'll show some examples if it didn't make any sense, and here are some examples right now. And here's example number one, and the reason I have my camera on this side now is because I don't want you guys to see like double camera angles or anything like that. But yeah, this pro player is Han Sama. He used to play in EU, then went to NA, now he's back in EU. And he's recently played at this year's MSI as well. And he's always a world's contender too. So let me let the clip play. And I can't really play the clip with volume only because of the fact that um, it has some copyright music on it and everything like that, so. See like right here? Like I said, League players have a tendency of when they see an enemy champion running away like this, they will face forward and the only way to land your ulti on Cassio in terms of the stun is for them to face you. So I saw this and took the opportunity and decided to R flash. And I ended up getting a double kill here as well. Mm -hmm. So I'll let, the, I'll let the clip fully play. It, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a hard timing window and you have to kind of be quick with it, so. Mm -hmm, like that. And it's a really good way to catch people off guard. Even high elo players, even pro players will always get cut off, caught off like that. So this is example number two. Now I'm playing against a Diana mid and I am taking trades with her and I'm winning the trade, but I end up running away just so that I know that she can face me. So let's watch the clip right now. See right here? I end up, I end up winning the trade, but I end up not fully chasing her and turn around. And what does Diana do now? And you see where my cursor is already? As soon as she turned around, my, my, well, before she turned around, my cursor is already here. Like I click once back, but my cursor, and then I immediately put my cursor here without clicking anything, just having it ready. And as soon as she turned around, because like I said, league players have a tendency of just turning around when they see an enemy champion running away, right? And I took that opportunity at once again and ended up old flashing. And she ended up dying, well, eventually. I see a lot of Cassiopeia players make this mistake, but when they end up finishing Rylai second, they end up still trying to land their keys first before landing their E. But at this point in the game, the Rylai is slow for 30%, right? So in order to have a higher percentage of your Q landing, which means that if you have a higher percentage of your Q landing, the more damage output you will get because of the empowered E 
if the enemy is poisoned. So what you really want to do actually is you want to press E first to slow them. And while they're slowed, then you can press Q. So when you get your Rhyolite, you should be looking to press your E first so that you have a higher success rate of landing your Qs. So instead of just doing a Q and then landing your Es, because most likely they're not, they might have better movement than you, they might have better micro than you, and they'll be able to dodge pretty well. But it's harder for them to dodge if you slow them first by just pressing E, which is a lock-on click ability, right? So you press E first and slow them, and then you can press Q and start pressing your um, E and getting all the damage across. So the way I play Cassio is that most people will start playing really really aggro at level 2 and they'll start spamming their abilities, like spamming their E's permanently, right? And that can be good, but for now, because of the durability patch, you kind of run out of mana pretty quickly at level 2 if you're just spamming your abilities. And you'll soon quickly realize that champions that build Thorn Shields and has a lot of sustain, um, they will kind of out heal the amount of mana that you're going to use, so you'll run out of mana pretty quickly. So for me, typically, I don't play too aggro the first, like, levels 1 to 3, and I start playing a little bit more aggro at level 4, but... If you do want to end up playing a little bit aggro in lane, you should be looking to just press Q and zoning them a little bit from CS. Every time they go for CS, you press Q on them and you can walk up and walk back forward and space them a little bit. And you can even throw some autos, couple E's, but don't just be spamming your E's permanently because that is never a good idea. Now for mid to late game, you do want to end up going to the side lane and most people are going to be like, oh what, but you're playing a mage, how can a mage split push? But after knowing all of Cassio's abilities and how she works, we should know by now that Cassio is a battle mage that can take on 1v2s, 1v3s, and still come out on top, right? So when you are split pushing, make sure you utilize the bushes to its fullest potential. Now, Cassio is really great for bush users only because of the fact that she has a big AoE ult and the distance is pretty large as well. So let's just say, for example, the enemy's coming here, you're, let's just say you got mid tower first or enemy bot lane lost their tower and then now they're rotating mid and now you're gonna have to be split pushing on the side, right? So the enemy's like right here, he's walking, he's walking, he's walking, and as soon as he's here, and he might just have, he might just try and ward it as well, but even in the ward distance is not, it's basically this less distance than the actual R itself. So the ward distance is here, but the R distance is farther. So they won't even be able to like ward it before getting stunned. And you can just here and start end up killing them here. And then you just gain so much pile for your team. So that's a really, really great way of playing Cassio in the silent is just by utilizing bushes and cheesing them as much as possible. Another great bush to do is this one right here. So this bush right here is a really, really good bush cheese that you can like sit in here while the enemy comes this way. Same with the top one. It's, it's basically the same here and the same here as well. And that's just a very simplistic version of how to play Cassio in the early game and how to play Cassio in the mid to late game. And if you want to see full on gameplay, I do stream on Twitch on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays and sometimes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So you can come and ask and watch my VODs or watch me play live on Cassio because I have been playing a lot more recently again. Now before the video ends, I do want to talk about Cassio's matchups, the ones that are very very hard and the ones that are very free. Now Cassio does really well into short range matchups and melee matchups that need sustain. And she struggles really really hard against matchups that have long range and outranges her. I put Victor in the highest tier because Victor doesn't really have a lot of skill shots and people are going to be like, oh but Victor's E is like a skill shot and everything like that. But if the Victor is an actual human player, it's very very hard to miss the E. It's basically a point and click at that point. And for the Orianna matchup, I put this at very hard as well. It's only for the fact that her ball controls so much area and her cooldowns are very, very short. And it's very hard to misplace your Q as Orianna as you get more cooldowns because in general, Orianna likes to build the Lost Chapter and a lot of them do like to build Lucidity. So the Q cooldown is basically non-existent. Now, it's not to say that these matchups are very impossible, like the Azir, Syndra, Anivia, Orianna, Victor. Now, these matchups are all hard because they outrange Cassio completely. But as long as you're playing well and as long as you're taking the right runes, taking the right summoner spells and trading properly, they are winnable. So these are matchups that like you can win in if you are playing well. It's not like a doomed matchup from like the beginning and you can't do anything about it. Now for the skill tier list, I kind of put champions that kind of go even with Cassio or champions that have very very good gank potentials for example leblanc uh, most of the time you should be able to win 1v1s permanently against leblanc but because of her high gank potential a lot of junglers look towards mid because of her her w gap close her e chain stun and everything like that so that's why i put her in the skill tier list now i do want to mention the fact that quirky matchup is very very free 
only in the early to mid game, but as soon as late game happens, that's when Corky becomes like a little bit unplayable because of the package and how much range he gets. Now, a lot of the easier matchups as well are not as easy as they may seem. You still have to play pretty decently. These lanes can get volatile, so your best choice is to not let them get volatile. Because if the lanes do get pretty aggro and you end up fighting and you end up losing the fight because maybe they played a little bit better than you or sometimes they get lucky, um, they become very, very hard to play. So just make sure that you are not making that many mistakes and you're waiting for them to make a mistake and you can capitalize on them. And like I said earlier, if you do want a more in-depth guide or have more questions to ask, you can ask them in the comments down below or check out my stream on Twitch. My Twitch is just Aaron Song TV, and I'm usually live every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And I do occasional streams on Tuesdays, Thursdays, but those are days that where I kind of edit for YouTube. So um, you might get a surprise stream one of those days though. Thank you guys so much for watching my first guide and I hope you guys learned a thing or two. And if you do end up enjoying this, please like, comment, and subscribe. And um, let me know if you guys want another guide on a different champion and if I should add more details or like more gameplay oriented or anything like that. But I do post every Saturday at 12 p.m. EST. So if you guys do want to see another video, please be sure to check me out again on Saturday. Bye guys.